everyone. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, let's hop right to it. Once a rare occurrence to find someone cosplaying at a convention, there are now a large portion of attendees dressing up as their favorite characters. For some, it's a hobby or passion project, while others aspire to make it a career. So, how does cultural acceptance of cosplay in the mainstream affect the way it's viewed as a profession? Stella, why don't you start us off? Hey, so cosplay has changed so much um, recently. So we didn't have like this being a profession um, prior to like 2000 and I guess like 15 or something like that. Um, I think with like the advent of the internet being being great for social media influencers and um, like technology just kind of where it is now and how many people are, are connected, it's gotten so much easier for us to be able to put our our art out there and to get noticed and to get people to support us. Um, so I think because of that, that's why um, cosplay is as big as it is today. Yep. Uh, Becca, what, what about you? How do you feel about cultural acceptance um, around the hobby? Um, I think that because it's it's gotten so huge and become a lot more mainstream where people know about it and um, feel okay running around dressing up, um, it's made it a lot easier for people to take that and turn it into something where they can actually um, maybe, you know, not quite make a living off of it, but um, on their way there. Uh -huh. um, I have um, taken a more educational route where I've been um, teaching classes on um, uh, armor and prop making. So, um, and I do that um, in a studio in Manhattan and I have people coming in on a daily basis um, from colleges and shows and films um, who are just now hearing about it and wanting to get into it and they're very eager. So it's it's crossing different boundaries and reaching different um, places that we never even thought it would. Yeah. Harrison, what's been uh, your experience with kind of the overall cultural acceptance of cosplay or prop making as a career? Um, I think that there's been a real change um, with the advent of social media where companies are starting to recognize that genuine fans uh, are better promoters of their work uh, than it would be to just, you know, hire uh, an agency that might only be in it for a paycheck. Uh, the, the kind of passion that we can bring to a project, the way we bring it to life and the, the, the true excitement that we have of it is of value. Um, and the fact that we're willing to, to bring these things to life uh, companies are willing to partner with us. It's it's a really good uh, marriage. It's how we you know make our, our business here by uh, creating props from properties that we really love and enjoy. Um, and so not only does the company get you know a really cool thing at the end, but they also get to show off how it's built. They get to interact with the community, and it, it shows that they care about their fans as much as we care about their uh, intellectual properties. Absolutely. So uh, the reason we brought this up today was that there is a cosplay agency that's begun in Japan specific um, to cosplay representation and getting them hired out for certain events. So um, Stella, as someone that is a part of an agency, do you think there's advantages and disadvantages to joining one or maybe they might they connect you to opportunities you wouldn't otherwise get? I think there's only advantages to joining a agency because you you're when you're just a cosplayer by yourself at home, you don't have connections to people in the industry. Maybe going to a convention, you'll meet somebody at some industry meetup, but that's very limited to what your uh, time is and everything. So having someone out there who is scoping this out for you, who's organizing you for you and helping you plan things it makes your life so much easier because then it get, lets the cosplayers stay at home to build their costumes. It's what they, they want to do. It's what they're good at. Um, you know, we didn't go to school for marketing. You know? <laughs> so it, it would just be so much easier if somebody was there on our team to help us through like these things that are really hard and, and don't really come naturally. Sure. Uh, so Becca, what are your thoughts around uh, joining a cosplay agency? Is that something that intrigues you or you're like, no, I'm good. Like handling my own stuff. <laughs> Completely agree with Stella. I think that um, there's really only good things that can come out of that. I think it's an enormous opportunity for a cosplayer to have agency representation because it does give you um, access to a bunch of things that you wouldn't um, have access to or, or even know how to get into. Um, and also, as Stella mentioned, we didn't go to school for marketing. I have no idea how to even begin to, you know, reach out sometimes. So I think that somebody who 
that's what they do professionally um, is a great resource for a cosplayer to have. And since cosplay is like the next like big thing, you know, it's it's not exactly on the same level as being an actor, but it's it's in the same kind of bubble and it's not going anywhere. It's only getting bigger. And, you know, uh, hiring a cosplayer for something can be the next thing. Mm -hmm. So um, an agency can connect you with the right people for partnership deals, uh, but let's discuss some of those opportunities. Uh, Harrison, can you provide some insight on how you went from making cosplay costumes and props into trophies for esports tournaments? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that kind of came out of nowhere, but it's, it's really turned into a, a fantastic business for us because we got in very early, um, and we're kind of the biggest name in, in making, you know, esports trophy type stuff. Like, um, of you know, course things like, you have one. <laughs> it's a show of course I have one, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, no, we're not, we're not, we don't keep these uh, normally, but uh, this was a rare occurrence in which we uh, plated the project gold instead of silver, so we ended up just finishing this to have for <laughs> ourselves to show off uh, at the studio. Um, but esports is becoming a huge thing, and um, we, uh, we kind of got on the ground floor of that, uh, with a contact uh, from Riot Games. Um, you know, we'd done a couple of small collectible things, and we'd done, you know, props for years, very high uh, high detail, high fidelity props, and uh, there's a lot of transitive skills between that and building uh, tournament trophies. So um, Riot Games reached out to so us. This was actually the first slide that you guys uh, showed there, and we did a project for them. I think that was 2013, and, uh, it, you know, we approached it very differently. We approached it from the mindset of people who are fans, people who want to see something neat. And so it didn't necessarily look like, a, you know, a standard cup or a big clear piece of glass with a name edged into it. And companies love that, you know. They love that now the, the esports pieces look like items from their properties. And so, uh, you know, we've got tons of business there. Um, really exciting stuff. That is very exciting. So, uh, Stella, you are often hired by game developers and publishers to create costumes based off their IPs. What does that process look like? It's super fun. It's probably um, some of my favorite builds were from uh, companies that worked directly with me to create either their own characters or like create my own character, uh, which is really nice because it, it feels like I'm finally um, being a part of the things I love. You know, when I'm just cosplaying like normal from watching some show that I really love, uh, there's a disconnect there of like, hey, I'm just like being a fan. But when I'm actually making something for the company and their creators are talking directly to me saying how excited they are that they're seeing their their um, their creations come to life, it like it's really nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I really I really love that feeling. So I want to continue to be able to work with a lot of companies to help like bring their brand um, to to like the fans and stuff and, and show them that like I'm just as passionate as the fans are. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Without revealing too many details, can you talk a little bit about like the minutia of like, do they pay you to make the costume and then pay you to appear at an event or how does that work? Yeah, uh, both actually. So they pay for the costume, which is labor and materials. And then they also pay me to um, appear at a convention and they may also just um, pay me to like do social media posting. Uh, which is just as valuable as uh, appearing at a convention because you have like you know a lot of eyes on you and stuff. And especially if it's on social media posting, then at least I can like tell people um, you know what the link is to download and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So uh, Becca, coming over to you, you partnered with McCall's Patterns. How did you come up with which pattern to develop and, and talk about a little bit about that process? Um, well, they basically um, were. When they first approached me, they were interested in my uh, My Little Pony designs, um, of course, which I couldn't reproduce for them because <laughs> that's branded. Um, so I just um, did something kind of based off of that. And then um, as we were talking, they realized that my specialty really was in armor making. So they asked me if I'd be interested in doing some armor patterns for them, um, which was a huge step out of their bubble because they're a sewing company. And um, armor is something they have never done before. Uh, so we talked and came up with some designs. And um, I met with their team and just did some like little workshops to show them how to use the material so they would understand a little bit better. And um, now we have, I think there's three or four patterns and there's more coming out. Um, there will be patterns for props as well. 
That's pretty exciting. I feel like if you <laughs> asked me five years ago if there would be cosplay patterns to buy from like a major store, I wouldn't have believed you. So um, clearly this has been a growing market for crafting stores like Joanne and Michael's or even non-traditional arts and craft stores like Harbor Freight or like Home Depot. So like how has cosplayers partnering with sewing brands kind of changed the landscape of the scene? Um, Harrison, why don't you start us off? Um, well, first off, uh, I can't sew, so uh, that's the, the first caveat. Uh, I know that Yaya Han, um, mm -hmm. she lives here in Atlanta, uh, has partnered with um, Joanne Fabrics, and she has her own line of fabrics, which uh, I think is a brilliant step because the quality that they're they're getting. Um, I know she's very picky about what she sponsors and what she wants shown with her name on it. Um, there's a couple of other companies uh, here in Atlanta that have uh, have thrived a lot because of the explosion of cosplay. A um, uh, company we get all of our resins and casting and silicone materials from, uh, a local supplier here, has just grown and grown and grown over the years because people have heard about a, a company called Smooth On. Um, that's where we get all of our plastics and stuff from. So, you know, we write tutorials. We, you know, endorse these products. Uh, this company, Smooth On, they used to make stuff for you know, making concrete molds for people's gardens is now <laughs> doing cosplay tutorials and telling people how to, you know, um, finish a 3D printed helmet. It's really neat. Yeah. Uh, Stella, what about you? How do you think uh, kind of the cosplay space has changed and thanks to some of these partnerships and uh, more stores like Joanne and Michael's getting on board? It's made it a lot easier for new people to jump into the hobby. So there's, um, like back in the day, we didn't have any patterns. I never used a pattern when I first started out, and I actually had to teach myself how to how to build my own costumes from scratch without any help because I didn't really, I couldn't go and just buy a pattern for this weird jacket that an anime created but doesn't exist in real life. So um Putting, having those those patterns ready available at a store is makes it really awesome. And I actually designed my own patterns to put on Etsy um, from for, for costumes that are really hard to build for other people. Um, th that ranges from like sewing to like armor and everything. And like I want to be able to provide that for other people. I think that's definitely the next step for everyone is to continue to share within the community um, all of these things that we've learned because uh, the cosplay community grew in the last 10 years because of everything everyone else has learned. You know, Ava Foam, which is the foam that we use to build a lot of armor pieces, um, was discovered by like a handful of people and they spread their knowledge and now everyone uses Ava Foam. And Ava Foam is, you can buy it anywhere at Home Depot. It's what they use in garage floor mats um, and stuff. So we never would have known that unless people went and tinkered and discovered it and then shared their knowledge. Mm -hmm. So Becca, did you think that five years ago you'd be running Warbla or crafting workshops? Not, it wasn't even like the realm of possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I never set out to become anything. I just was doing this because I love making stuff. Um, I just have always loved making things with my hands and cosplay, making my own costumes seemed like the next step. And that just kind of gradually spilled into what I'm doing now. Um, and I, I love teaching because there's so many people who want to learn and you know don't know how to use Warbla or EVA, and they come in here and they're so excited. Um, and I work in a store that supplies film, theater, um, and uh, television uh, wardrobe supplies, and we have shows that are you know stocking for their upcoming seasons, and they've never used Warbla before, and they'll see me working on it, and they'll send people to take my classes because they want to use it for their shows. Um, and I think that's really amazing. That's great. So what do your work schedules look like? How do you balance your cosplay life of creating, promoting, and making appearances with a personal life? Harrison's laughing, so I'm asking you first. <laughs> uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of deadlines coming up. Um, one of the largest gaming conferences, uh, E3, is just around the corner. And then there's Dragon Con and PAX. And uh, this is also the big season for esports. Um, so mm -hmm. like I said before, I have... I have uh, two full-time artists. I have a full-time business manager here. Um, they they all work, you know, roughly 40 hours a week. Um, we bring on various freelancers. There's about three or four 3D artists um, that we uh, we contract out to, and several 2D artists as well. Myself, um, I work somewhere between 65 and 70 hours a week, every week. Uh, I have done that literally for the past seven and a half, eight years. Um, and uh, that sounds absolutely insane. I cannot recommend that, that <laughs> lifestyle to people. 
Um, but this is my passion. I can't do anything else that I, I wouldn't be able to approach it with this much fervor. If, if I have free time, I come here. You know, I, I want to be at my shop. And sure. um, i got to get dragged away by my friends. So uh, I feel like if you are really passionate about a thing, you'll put a lot of time and work and effort into it. And uh, those are the people who are going to be successful in a, in a sort of transitional hobby to career type thing uh, like cosplay is. Mm -hmm. All right, Stella. What does your work schedule look like? How do you make the? How do you do the balance? <laughs> uh, my schedule is kind of uh, intense. Um, I, I clocked in like how many hours I was working um, a few months ago. It, it ended up being 16 hours a day uh, because I, not only was I waking up at 8 a.m. and working all the way until I started Twitch streaming, but then I'd also Twitch stream. And then by the time I was done Twitch streaming, uh, you know, do a lot of like. Uh, business management on my computer and then go to bed at midnight. <laughs> so uh, that is a very easy way to burn out as a cosplayer. Um, but I, I've, and I, I don't, I don't know how to have a work life balance to be honest with you. Cause I, I have too much fun cosplaying. I have, um, I just want to build with my hands all the time. And I, I don't know, it's just really fun. <laughs> I really love it. And I try not to count the hours. Um, but I also play as hard as I work. So I, I guess I, scrunch up all of my free time into like weeks and then like go on vacation for like a whole week but as soon as I come back I'm like back to that 16 hour a day thing sure <laughs> uh Becca do you have a similar experience how do you do the work-life balance um I don't I don't know what work-life balance is <laughs> um I think that it seems to be a common thread <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I just I think that if you're really passionate about something it's not it's not really like work all the time like sure sometimes I like have to talk myself getting through the last steps of a new costume or or prop or something but um for the most part I'm I'm just doing it because I love it and if I stop loving it then I'm not gonna do it anymore <laughs> um but uh I'm here I, I get up at like seven um and I think I go to bed around one or two every day um, the only day that I don't really do that is uh, Thursday because I have a bunch of different um, errands and stuff I do on that day. But um, otherwise, I'm either at the store or teaching or working on my own stuff. Um, I have always have about three or four projects going on at the same time. So. Gotcha. All right, guys, it's time to take a quick break. But before we do, I want to ask our viewers to leave a comment or send us a tweet at Game Talk Live, letting us know what topics you'd like to see us discuss on the show. We'll be right back. Hi, my name's Todd. We're going to be playing some H1Z1, and a lot of you out there are going to be able to win some prizes by guessing when our guests die. Sasha, are you ready to go play some H1Z1? Let's do this. I think yeah, we've right. seen this story before. <laughs> we've got a lot of guests tonight from all over the world. They're competing for a trophy, our Champion of the Night prize. Which one of you is going to be the best player tonight? Anybody that comes in my way is done. Get a helmet, get a backpack, get a rifle. Kill everyone. Pull that person. Engage. Kill. Oh my god! I give the people what they want to see. Oh my god! god. Oh wow, he took a big hit. Oh he got it god. god! Can you throw me in like the Norwegian server or like some place where they're just no. not gonna find me? No, no, no. Did I die first? No one's died that early in the game ever. Welcome back, everybody. Let's get into our final topic today. Membership service Patreon has been a game changer for creators of all kinds, allowing them to distribute content to their fans with full control over monetization. So has Patreon been pivotal in making cosplay a viable career option? Has this platform given rise to a whole new avenue in which cosplayers or creatives of all kinds can make money off their craft? Becca, why don't you start us off? Um, I actually tried using Patreon and it just wasn't for me. <laughs> I just okay. didn't have enough discipline. So, is that what it is? I mean, it just, can you enlighten us a little bit about why you don't think it worked out for you personally? 
Um, I just, um, I guess I don't work well with having to provide, knowing I have to provide um, constant um, content for people um, and having to like absolutely meet those deadlines. I just, I found out that I'm not very good at that. Um, so <laughs> it works very well for some people. Um, and I think that it's a really, really great resource for a lot of people and, you know, artists and patrons have been a thing for hundreds of years. Um, and this is the modern day version of it. So I'm really, really glad that it's around and it's giving um, cosplayers and other artists um, a way to, uh, just another way to um, create income for what they're doing. I think that's great. Um, for me personally, not <laughs> That's fine. Not, not everyone <laughs> has to use it. So uh, Stella, I would love to hear from you as someone that uses a uh, Patreon. And uh, do you think it's opened up this whole new avenue, this whole new revenue stream for creatives to, to make money? Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing this without Patreon because it's nice to have a consistent flow of money. You know exactly how much you're going to get every month. Um, and that's why Patreon is so uh, important to me, because if I didn't have it, then I just wouldn't have gone full time cosplay at all. Uh, you know, like every month, I don't know if I'm going to have, say, a gig or a, a appearance or um, as social media per, uh, thing at all. So having Patreon there to provide me with like a set amount of income is just it, it gives me like a, a weight off of my shoulder and allows me to build um, what I want to build um, rather than worrying about when's my my next paycheck. Mm -hmm. So uh, Harrison you sell patterns and blueprints through your own web store have you considered using Patreon to distribute some of that content? Actually uh, we ran a fairly successful Patreon for about 18 months. Um, it it worked very well, uh, and the community that came out of it is one I still interact with. We have a, a private Facebook group. There are all the people that were part of the Patreon still participate, and we, we talk about projects and builds and that kind of thing. Um, my problem, uh, sort of similar to Becca's, was that um, my, my own schedule tended to get in the way a lot of times. Um, working in industry uh, with a lot of um, non-disclosure agreements, we can't do live streams, we can't do updates. So we'll have a blackout period of two or three months wherein our social media stuff will just tank. And it's because you know everything's gotta be behind a black curtain, we can't show anybody, and then it gets revealed somewhere. And that makes for a really good reveal moment, but it doesn't make for good Patreon content. So um, we managed to kind of juggle that for about a year and a half. It was really great. Um, I know a lot of prop makers that do Patreons, they're very successful at it. Um, I kind of, uh, pursuing that for a little while, I chose to uh, go more along the lines of a, uh, a studio um, than uh, an individual artist. Um, and we're focusing a little bit more on, you know, providing things directly to our clients. Um, you know, it was tough to, to, uh, to walk away from it. Um, like Stella said, it was uh, secure income and, and it was great to engage with our, with our fans. But um, I think it's fantastic. I think uh, everybody who is an artist, regardless of whether it's cosplay, musician, illustrator, whatever, definitely needs to engage in that. It's one of the best things to happen to um, you know independent artists in a long time. Sure. So Stella, how do you come up with all these back rewards for your different tiers, and how do you, I guess, handle feeding the beast, if you will? <laughs> Seems like a lot of work. It's not easy. I I constantly change up my tiers all the time to figure out exactly what works. I mean, the the flow of content with all of the other people on Patreon and kind of learning from them what works and what doesn't work uh, is really important. So you kind of have to have your like finger on the pulse a little bit. Um, and understanding like what my workload is because just because, you know, the first month maybe two people were supporting me on this specific tier, but then like you know, by the 10th month, like 100 people are supporting me on that tier, like I had to convert that time and that workload so I can provide um, for those, you know, extra amount of people. So just learning how to balance that out has been um, interesting. But what's nice is that I have a direct line to the people who are supporting me and I'm constantly asking them, you know, how I can do things better, what they'd like to see more. Um, and, you know, they're the ones paying for my content, so they really get a say in what I create. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've talked about, you know, prop making, professional prop making, or running workshops, uh, having a Patreon account, there's all these, or making event appearances, there's all these different ways in which cosplayers and creatives can make money off this. But when does cosplay evolve into, say, costuming or a professional career? Like, what is that, like, how do you know? Where's the line, if you will? Becca? Um, I mean, I guess, like, the 
definition of being a professional versus not is whether or not you're actually hired to do something and somebody's willing to um, pay you for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the true definition. Obviously, that line can get blurred quite a bit, but um, uh, that's, I think, how I would define being a professional cosplayer or prop maker. Um, and then you can just kind of take that once you get your first taste of that and try to build on it. Um, I don't, I don't know, like a professional cosplayer is a really weird um, term. I know the community doesn't really like it very much, mm-hmm. but I think that there's um, room for it to actually become a real thing. You know, there's professional sports players, there's professional actors and um, artists why not cosplayers right so it's it's something that is is definitely here and it's just getting bigger we're working toward it so harrison how do you educate the community on say cosplay as a hobby and then cosplay as a career because i see you as someone that has definitely made it a career (laughs) absolutely um i think that uh if i had to if i had to delineate between one and the other I would say that the thing that separates a you know a hobbyist from a uh, from a professional is um, the way in which you interact and provide for your clients. Um, I believe that anybody that takes a job and delivers you know on time on budget with a with a good product is a professional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know you don't you don't need to move into a, a giant warehouse or or uh, you know even have an active Patreon or or any of the other uh, check marks. I think. Um, in, in this sort of gig economy we found ourselves in, whatever work you can get is uh, your new definition. And so some of us, uh, for a little while, we might be a professional cosplayer, but also professional photographer, but also like, you know, uh, amateur screenplay writer. You know, we wear a lot of different hats. And I, I don't think there's any problem with one person calling themselves a professional when they're working out of their home and, you know, or, you know, have four roommates or whatnot. Um, I just tell people uh, that if you want to do something like this and you want to make it your full-time thing, you got to pursue it with a lot of passion. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to understand that building something from the ground up like this takes a lot of work. And cosplay, I think a lot of people see it as you know a fun hobby. Um, but imagine if your entire career was that one week before the con when you're trying to get a costume <laughs> done. And just take that and, and make it several years in a row and and then you're a professional cosplayer i am very tired just thinking about that harrison (laughs) (laughs) so stella is cosplay a viable career option i think it depends on how you approach it there there are several ways but um i think my issue is like how the longevity is it's just like you know someone saying they want to be a professional youtuber or professional gamer professional twitch streamer um So figuring out, you know, where that's going to take you, do you want to do it for the next five years or the next 10 years? Or are you even thinking about that? Are you just wanting to to do it for the now um, and see where it goes? And it's, it's, I don't know, that's like life advice. (laughs) Uh, So I'd say for the the person who wants to become a professional cosplayer right now, it is way more possible now than it ever was before. It is so much easier to buy costumes, to learn how to make costumes. There's tutorials everywhere. You can collaborate with other people. You can, there's so many doors open now that weren't open before. And so if you wanted to just overnight become a professional cosplayer, you just have to work really hard and you can do it. All right, guys, we are coming to the end of our show. I want to thank all of our viewers and our guests for being here. Tell us what you're currently working on and where people can find you on social media. And we'll start with Stella. I'm currently working on a Shadow of the Colossus costume um, where I'm going to be doing it with a bunch of other people who are also going to be dressed up as the Colossi from Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, we're doing that for uh, Colossal Con, which is in two weeks. And, the uh, puns on me. puns on puns. I hey. love it. <laughs> hey. Sorry. Uh, so... You can find me, uh, Stella Chu, on all social media. I also uh, live stream on Twitch and Caffeine uh, five days a week. So you can catch me later on tonight, uh, 5 o'clock PST. Great. Thanks, Stella. All right, Harrison, what are you currently working on? And where can people find you online? Uh, all of our work is currently NDA, so I can't tell you about our professional projects. I am working on a couple of costume pieces for, uh, for Dragon Con. A very... 
Uh, specific thing that nobody but me will know, uh, except a handful of people who are really into Final Fantasy XI, if anybody played Black <gasps> Mage uh, in Final Fantasy XI. Harrison, I'm I played the, for five years. <laughs> ah, I'm making the Agira Westkit set, actually, which Amazing. is the level 75 Black Mage gear. Uh, excellent, somebody else who gets yes. it. And I'm making a, a Kraken <laughs> Club and a uh, Genbu Shield, so a bunch of old school 2002 props. Um, but uh, they're favorites of mine. I've always wanted to do it. Uh, we have a ton of projects back there in the warehouse that uh, are going to be debuting over the next several months. Um, really cool stuff. And when those go live, you can see it on all of our social media channels, which is pretty much Vulpin Props everywhere. Just one word, Vulpin Props. Thanks, Harrison. All right, Becca, what do you currently got going on, and where can people find you online? Um, I am currently working on uh, my own original... Um, take on Storm from X-Men. Um, it's an armored version that has a little bit of Wakandan influence. And that is for um, Comic Palooza, which is in Houston um, this weekend. And I am pretty much everywhere um, as Becca Noel on every social media, and that's where you can find me. Um, I also teach classes um, at Manhattan Wardrobe Supply um, every Wednesday and Saturday. Great. Thanks, Becca. And thanks to everyone who watched, commented, and shared the show. I'm Andy Roman. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and watch Game Talk Live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific. We'll see you next time.